So shall we start? Yes. Please do. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So welcome to the world's lecture. Uh, uh, we have a 15 minutes uh, talk plus uh, uh, 10 minutes questions. Questions should be asked via chat and I'll ask them to the speaker. Uh, it is my great honor to introduce the speaker, Martin Barrow from the University of British Columbia. Martin got bachelor and diploma in the University of Cambridge and then got PhD at the University of Wales in 1979 under the super supervision of David Williams. Martin worked as a research fellow at the University of Liverpool, Tr Trinity College in Cambridge and was a Royal Society University Research Fellow. In 92, he moved to the University of British Columbia, where he was a professor until 2018. He's now a, 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 an emeritus professor in UBC. He has made significant contributions to the probability theory by producing beautiful results and theories. They include diffusions on fractals, such as Sierpinski gaskets and Sierpinski carpets, random walks on uh, random media, such as percolation clusters, non-local Dirichlet forms and jump processes, harmonic analysis on graphs and metric measure spaces, properties of Levy processes, in particular about local times, and so on. He, has award, he was awarded many prizes and honors, including the Rollo uh, Davidson Prize in 84, Fellow by MS in 91, Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 98, Fellow of the Royal Society in 2005, CRM Peel's uh, PIMS Prize in 2009, and Fellow of the I, uh, AMS in 2012. He was an invited speaker of ICM in 1990 in Kyoto and gave sample lectures in two, uh, 1995. During the Congress, he will give three talks. The title of his talk is Random Walks and Fractal Graphs. So Martin, please start. Thank you very much, Takashi, for this um, uh, introduction. I hope I'm um, audible. And um, thank you for the honor of inviting me to be the um, world lecturer for this Congress. So um, this is the um, topic of my talks. And let me start by um, discussing the uh, motivation. I'm just, uh, OK. Uh, if I minimize that, I can see you yeah, at the top of the slide. So one of those little technical things. Okay, so the motivation for the work that I'm going to be discussing um, goes back to an article by Pierre de Gênes, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1991. And he wrote an article in a French um, journal, La Recherche, which is a sort of um, a similar, a French version in a way of the Scientific American. And in this 1976 article on percolation, um, he introduced um, many uh, interesting ideas. So here's a, a photograph of Tijen. And uh, here is the cover of the um, article. Um, you won't be able to read, I suspect, the small type um, below. So I've translated it, roughly speaking, into English. Um, the article, title of the article is Percolation, a Unifying Concept. And the text says that proposed in 1956 by the English mathematician Hammersley, the concept of percolation permits a statistical description of systems consisting of a large number of objects which be connected. And then he goes on to discuss some of the features of that, which I'll go over again in a moment. Uh, I don't quite know what the relevance of the uh, photograph of um, students is to the percolation concept, but there we are. So uh, if you go by published work, it was introduced by Broadbent and Hammersley in 1957. Broadbent was working on gas masks for use in coal mines, and Hammersley's description of the problem was as follows. These masks contained porous carbon into which the gas could penetrate. The pores were net a network of interconnecting tunnels, and if the pores were richly enough connected, the gas could permeate the carbon, but if not, then the gas would not get beyond the surface. So they found there was a critical point above which the mass worked well and below which it didn't. And so they looked at a sort of toy model in um, uh, probability or statistical physics to describe this um, situation. And here is the model. You start with a complete network consisting of vertices, 
complete network or graph, we would say, consisting of vertices and bonds. You choose a probability P and you keep each bond with um, that probability independently of all the others. And in the picture that I have here, um, P is uh, 0.4. So here are a few pictures of the um, percolation process. Um, here's a rectangle with P equals 0.2, and I've highlighted the largest cluster. If we increase P to 0.4, of course, there are more bonds, and the largest cluster is up there um, uh, towards the top right. If we go to P equals 0.5, the, the largest cluster is bigger still. And in this case, actually, we see that we have a cluster which makes a right to left crossing of the um, uh, rectangle and also a top to bottom cross. If we increase P a bit more to 0.6, the biggest cluster in the box now pretty much fills everything with only a few small bits not included, even more so when we get to P equals 0.8. So per percolation has what's called a phase transition. Um, the components of the graph connected by open bonds. <clears throat> that would be the graph theory terminology. Um, in percolation theory, um, it, they're called clusters. And percolation has a phase transition at a value um, PC strictly between zero and one. In the subcritical regime, when P is smaller than PC, all the clusters are finite and nearly all are small. If P is bigger than PC, then it took a while to prove this, but there is with probability one, a unique cluster, which I'll denote C infinity, and which extends infinitely far in all directions. When viewed at large length scales, this big cluster looks roughly like ZD. And I'll be discussing this more in more detail in the third lecture. And the regime change occurs sharply at a critical probability um, denoted PC. And critical percolation is the model when P equals PC. So let's define a function theta p, which is the probability that naught is in the infinite cluster, or another way of putting it is the cluster containing zero is infinite. So the big unsolved problem for percolation um, is the behavior of the function theta p at pc. When p is below pc, it's identically zero, and when P is bigger than PC, it's known to be a strictly increasing continuous function with um, theta of one being equal to one. So I've sketched here the two possibilities. Um, at PC, theta of P might be continuous or it might have a jump discontinuity. Everyone believes that it should be um, continuous and this has been proved in um, a number of cases, notably um, the first, result Keston 1980. Note that's um, more than 20 years after the model was originally formed. So it's indication of the difficulty of this model. And it's also known in high dimensions. Um, Har and Slade proved it for um, the first proof and then their methods have been um, improved to give uh, a lower number than their original number, which was I think 19. Um, but you can see, still see there's a gap between dimensions three and 10, um, and I won't go into the nature of that um, gap at this point. So in his article, De Gen was interested in what he, a physicist would call transport properties of critical percolation clusters, i.e. the clusters when P is actually equal to PC. And transport in physics language means how heat or waves propagate in the cluster. And De Gen suggested that one might use random walks on percolation clusters in order to study these um, properties. And he called the random walk um, the ant in the labyrinth. Physicists are very good, much better than mathematicians at thinking of um, nice um, sort of catchy terms for the things they're looking at. So the idea of the ant in the labyrinth is the, the ant does a random walk it runs around in the labyrinth, which is the percolation cluster, and it makes it moves um, at random along each channel or corridor in the labyrinth, which is available to it. So 
mathematically, we want to talk about um, random walk um, on a graph. And so I'm going to introduce a certain amount of terminology now, which is going to be um, fixed for the um, three talks that I'm giving. So let's take a graph, G equals VE, and the vertex set V is countable, um, either finite or infinite. Um, we use X twiddle Y to mean that um, X and Y are connected in this graph, i.e. that X, Y is an edge. I'm going to assume throughout these talks that the graph is locally finite. In other words, the number of neighbors, the set of neighbors of a point X is finite. And deg X is going to be the degree of X. In other words, the number of edges coming out of X or the number of neighbors of X. And the simple random walk um, is exactly what you'd think it would be. It's a Markov chain on the vertexes, which um, at each time, smet moves, time step moves from a point X to a randomly chosen neighbor. So we have these transition properties here. And I'm going to want a few other bits of notation. Px is the law of the process started at little x. Dxy is graph distance on the graph. Bxy is um, a closed ball, so to speak, with less than or equals there, um, center x and size r. And I'm going to introduce Pnxy to be not the transition probability, but the transition density with respect to the measure given by deg y. Um, the advantage of doing this is that we get a function which is symmetric um, in x and y. But if you think of pnxy as transition probabilities throughout these talks, you won't go far wrong. So what's the connection with fractals? As we saw, Dugen was particularly interested in the properties of critical percolation clusters. And random walk, as he suggested, provides one way of exploring these properties. Um, of course, um, Dugen was familiar with the close connection between transition probabilities, random walk, and heat flow. And more speculative in 1976 was that it was believed that critical percolation clusters should have fractal properties. Not very clearly um, defined what that exactly they meant by that. Um, and this has been confirmed in a number of ways since 1976, as we will see. So to see how random walk behaves on critical percolation clusters, um, one should look at random walks on fractals. Now, random fractals um, are quite hard. So um, the proposal in the physics literature that was that one should start by looking at easier examples. In other words, deterministic sets with lots of symmetry. Uh, well, perhaps the simplest fractal is the Cantor set, but it's not really connected. So we need to look at something in two dimensions. And the simplest example um, is the Sierpinski gasket. So here is the construction of the true fractal Sierpinski gasket. You start with the unit triangle in R2. You remove, you divide each line, edge in two, and you remove the downward facing um, inner triangle like that, leaving you with three smaller triangles each side a half. Now you repeat the process a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, and so on. And um, what you end up with, um, if you go um, all the way, look at the intersection of the resulting sets, is you get an uncountable connected um, uh, perfect subset, compact subset of R2. And so that's the set that I would call the true Sierpinski gasket. But we're looking at random walks on graphs. And so what we want to do is we want to build a graph which mimics the structure of the Sierpinski gasket. And you can see how to do it if we just look at the graph here that we've got, um, where the vertices are the corners of the triangles and the edges of the um, connections. We're, then we're going to get a large finite graph. Letting that go to infinity, we get an infinite graph. But let's just look at the construction on another set of slides just to make it absolutely clear what we're doing. So we start with a unit triangle um, in uh, like this. We add on two more unit um, triangles like that to create the first level structure or second level structure. Now we repeat that process. We take the object that we've got here and we duplicate it out above and to the right in the fashion that I've just done. Now we take the structure that we've got here, 
and we duplicate it again and we go on indefinitely. Um, and what we end up with is quite clearly an infinite countable graph. Um, and we can look at random walk on that graph. And so the basic question we have is, how does random walk behave on this graph? You'll see that it may be, you might expect slightly different behavior than the random walk on Z2. If you think about the random walk running around in this region here, um, it's constrained to stay in this region until it finds one of the two gateways here and here, which get it on to the next stage. And so the movement of the random walk is impeded by a, um, a collection of larger and larger obstacles. And so it's not unreasonable to expect that this random walk is going to behave in a fashion rather different from the simple random walk on Z2. So here is the key calculation that one makes for the Sierpinski gasket. So let's look at the, the random walk starting at the red um, vertex here, and let's run this simple random walk until it hits uh, one or other of the two blue vertices. So it's an easy calculation um, for on a six state Markov chain with symmetry to calculate how long it takes the random walk until it hits one or other of the blue vertices. And one five finds that the answer is five, which we're gonna call this the level two triangle because it's um, the distance across it is, um, uh, well, it's got, it's got um, actually perhaps I should, well, I'm gonna call this the level two triangle. And if we now look at the level three triangle like this, the crossing time is um, five squared. Basically it takes five steps on average to move across the um, level two triangles. And then if you call that a big step, it's gonna take on average five big steps. And each big step contains on average five little steps. So you get five squared. And the mean time to cross the level N triangle is five to the N minus one. And typically the simple random on the walk on the Sierpinski gasket graph takes time R to dW to move a distance R where dW is log five over log two. Of course, um, two to the dW is, um, or two to the N to the dW is um, five to the N. And so we can compare this with the simple random walk on ZD which takes time R squared to move a distance R. dW is bigger than two so the Sierpinski gasket random walk takes longer to move a certain distance than the random walk on Z2. And that's because of the obstacles that we've been um, discussing, or I mentioned earlier. So um, history is that physicists started looking at these kind of questions in the um, uh, early 1980s, and their interest sort of percolated through to the mathematical community around about 1985 or so. And Kusuoka and Goldstein um, independently gave construction of a continuum limit of the rescale random walks. So if X um, is the random walk, they proved that <clears throat> with this rescaling here, these processes converge weakly to a limiting diffusion process, which is a continuous strong Markov process on the true fractal Sierpinski gasket, which I described a few slides ago. And Perkins and I um, also um, did the same calculations. And then we went on to find out many more properties of this diffusion process, which we called um, Brownian motion on the Sierpinski gasket. Um, there's a lot to be said about the continuum limits of these processes, but I'm not going to go over that in these lectures now. And I'm going to concentrate on properties of the discrete models. So here are a couple of definitions that we will find useful in this um, talk. So let's consider an just um, an infinite connected graph G with simple random walk on it X. Um, useful notation is going to be tau XR is the exit time from um, the ball of, of radius um, R by the random walk X. And we can define um, if these limits exist two sort of dimensions 
um, associated with the, with the graph. Df, f standing for fractal g, is simply the limit as r goes to infinity of the um, log of the size of balls divided by log r. So df of zd in this case is going to be um, d. And dw of g is the limit of the mean times to exit um, a ball center x. By the way, it's easy to see that these dimensions don't depend, if they exist, they don't depend on the particular root x that you take. Um, also, you can, this for z, random walk on zd, this is going to be r squared. So you're going to find that dw of zd is two for all d. So we have these two, um, as physicists call them, dimensions of um, uh, a, a fractal gra or a graph, um, the fractal dimension df and the walk dimension dw. The, fra the fractal dimension gives you how quickly the volume of balls increases, and the walk dimension tells you things about the space-time scaling of the random walk. So the research um, on the Sierpinski gasket, the balls center zero and radius two to the n contains about three to the n points, and it takes time about five to the n to cross. And so one finds that the fractal dimension of the Sierpinski gasket is log three over log two, and the walk dimension is log five over log two. And I just remind you of the definition of the PNX one. So in our 1988 paper, we've my paper with Perkins, we obtained the transition densities for the continuum limit. Um, and then um, Owen Jones um, in 1991 showed that the same kind of estimates also hold for the um, random walk on the graph. And what gets these slightly forbidding at first sight, um, sub-Gaussian bounds on P and X, Y. So you'll notice that we have constants C1, C2, C3, and C4, um, different constants and we get the following um, form of the um, estimates. So we get upper and lower bounds of the same form, but with different constants ci. And since we're looking at a discrete time random walk, um, the transition probability is zero um, when the distance between x and y is bigger than n. So let's just look at slightly more, a few more, of, or go into a bit more detail on the um, properties of the transition density, or one might say also heat kernel on the graphical Sierpinski gasket. So this ugly symbol here is intended to say quickly that we get have an upper and a lower bound, um, but with, where you're allowed to change the constants C and C prime between the upper and lower bounds. So this is the basic form of the transition density. So let's just look at a few things about it. First of all, if we look at y equals x, then the distance between x and y is zero. So the term in the exponential is zero. And so we just get that pn x x is bounded above and below by constants times n to the minus df over dw. Um, df over dw um, is log three over log five and is smaller than one. So that tells us that the sum of pn x x diverges. And so using one of the standard tests for transients or recurrence, the random walk on the graphical Sierpinski gasket is recurrent. Um, this is much easier ways of proving it. In fact, we'll see one um, at the end of this lecture. If we integrate the bounds with a bit of work, one finds that the expected distance moved by the random walk is bounded above and below by constants times n to the one over dw. Um, and dw is bigger than two, so this means that the mean distance grows more slowly than the end of the one half that one is used to in ZD. And a final observation, this term in the exponential is a bit ugly, but if we put dw equals two, um, we get one over two minus one, which is one. And so this bit here disappears and we just get dxy squared over n. So we get a Gaussian type tail in the case when dw is equal to two. <clears throat> so um, that was the Sierpinski gasket. And at around the same time, 
other researchers started looking at some other examples of exact fractals. Um, in Lindstrom, in many cases, the works took a few years to um, appear. So these are the dates of the published works. You know, we knew about this, or I knew about this work, um, usually um, a year or two ahead of this. Lindstrom looked at a group of fractals called nested fractals. Kigami, a wider class of fractals, which he graphs, which he called PCF self-similar sets. And with Bass, I looked at the Sierpinski carpet. So the first two are examples of nested fractals. Um, and the final one here with the squares is the Sierpinski carpet. An important difference between the Sierpinski carpet and the other two is if you look at the random walk on the this set here, which many people call the Lindstrom, well, it's called the Lindstrom snowflake, you'll see that the random walk can only leave this region here by one of six, that is a finite number of exit points. Similarly here, um, there are only four exit points. But if you look at the random or sort of diffusion process in the Sierpinski carpet and the lower square here, it can leave at any point along the boundary of the square. So there are an uncountable number of different exit points. So that makes the Sierpinski carpet in some ways harder than the, um, the finitely ramified, as they're called, um, sets um, like PCF self-similar sets or nested fractals. So as I said, people looked at these other nice symmetric fractals. And by the late 1990s, we had the following general picture. For fractal graphs with enough symmetries, people found that one gets the same kind of sub-Gaussian bound on the transition probabilities as were obtained by for the Sierpinski casket with different values of DF and DW. And after studying a few families of examples, um, it's sort of helpful to step back and look for some undenying principles and keeping in mind the ultimate goal, which is to study random fractal graphs such as critical population clusters. And I'm going to be talking more about these in the second lecture. Um, the next thing to say is that perhaps the Sierpinski gasket is too easy. Um, that's a remark Harry Keston actually made to me, suggesting one might look at the Sierpinski carpet. And the Sierpinski carpet um, is rather harder, but studying it forces one to develop more general methods, which in the end turned out to be um, more robust and therefore easier to sort of get, get a handle on the sorts of things you've got to do for a random graph. And from the point of view of these ultimate applications, both the hypotheses, very strong symmetry, and the conclusions, sub-Gaussian transition probability bounds are too strong. One might like theorems which, with slightly weaker inputs, give you um, slightly weaker outputs. Um, if I can, for a moment, just make an, an analogy, the Central limit theorem tells you that if you've got IID, well, the basic central limit theorem tells you if you've got IID random variables with um, uh, finite variance, suitably rescaled, you get the Gaussian um, normal um, distribution as the limit of the sums. So one might like to have a slightly weaker version of the central limit theorem, which says if the input random variables are nearly independent a nearly Gaussian, then you get um, a nearly Gaussian limit. So, but while there's one basic central limit theorem, there's no sort of good global weakening of it. There are many different weakenings of the central limit theorem, relaxing the independence results um, in one or the or the, the, the CLT hypotheses in one or the other way, and getting um, various different conclusions. Um, so it may be much easier to produce a sort of ideal simple theorem than the more useful um, sort of approximations. That's just an, an, an analogy. So let's look at one particular way of um, weakening the um, original um, setup that we looked at. And that is to look at weighted graphs. So we've defined, sorry, uh, We've looked at um, infinite um, locally connected graphs. We can now add edge weights or conductances to the graph. So each edge you assign 
a weight. We assume that the weights of every edge is bigger than zero, and we define a function wxy, which is zero when x and y is not an edge, and is strictly bigger than zero when xy is an edge, and it's symmetric in x and y. So it's really a function on edges, un undirected edges rather than vertices or pairs of vertices. The natural weights of a graph um, are just one for an edge. And we're going to define wx to be the sum over y of the weights of the edges coming out of x, and a measure mu w, which is the sum, just the, um, gives the, the weight wy to each um, vertex y. And then we can extend our definition of random walk um, on a graph to random walk on a weighted graph, where now the random walk moves along the edge xy with probability proportional to wxy. And this random walk is reversible, and it has um, the invariant measure mu w. And a bit more um, uh, notation, I'm going to define the generator of the random walk, and I'm also going to define the energy or Dirichlet form in this fashion here. Um, so EFF is the sum over WXY of um, FY minus FX squared. And that's, as we will see when we talk about random walks and electrical resistance, um, closely associated with the energy of a function f. And we'll also want the concept of harmonic functions on a graph. And we say a function is harmonic in a region A in the graph if LH is zero for X in A. So supposing we've got a pair of weights W and W prime on a particular graph V E. We say the weights are comparable um, and we use this expression here, which means bounded above and below by constants. If for some constant C, we have the following relation here. So W prime is always between C to the minus one W and CW. And we say that a property of a random walk on a weighted graph is stable if whenever, if it, if whenever it holds for the original weights, that is the weighted graph GW, and you look at comparable weights W prime, then it will also hold for G W prime. So here are three properties of um, a random walk um, on um, possible properties of a random walk on a weighted graph, transients and recurrence, satisfying the sub-Gaussian bounds that I showed you with parameters alpha and beta, and the Liouville property, which is that all bounded harmonic functions are constant. So it turns out that the first two properties are stable and the final property, um, a well-known theorem of Terry Lyons in the mid 1980s is that the Liouville property somewhat surprisingly turns out not to be stable. So asking about stability is a sort of avenue to giving us some of the robustness that we want if we are to be able to handle um, random graphs. So it, in the final part of this talk, I want to say some things about random walks and electrical networks. Um, the material here is fairly elementary and may be very familiar to um, many, of, um, many of you, but um, experience has shown that it's not part of the standard education of probabilists, at least not in all countries. And so um, I think it will be useful for me to give you a brief reminder or introduction to the basic idea here. So in Feller's third edition of his um, textbook in probability, on page 425, he posed the following problem. You've got a graph which is recurrent and you remove some edges then you should prove that the new graph with the removed edges is also recurrent. It's not clear how Feller thought that one would solve that question, but this problem stimulated Doyle and Stull in 1984 to formalize the connections which have been known informally for quite a while to many people between random walks and electric networks. So let me just sort of tell you or remind you a little bit about the idea of electric networks. We have 
we start off with a finite weighted graph and we select two points A and B in the graph. Um, we assign to the edge E a conductance WE or a resistance WE to the minus one. And now we're going to connect an external battery to the points A and B. We use um, wires with um, zero um, uh, um, zero resistance or infinite conductance. And we impose this little symbol here is a symbol of a battery. We impose a potential difference between A and B. So currents are going to start flowing in the network. And the basic problem of networks like this is um, to describe how the um, currents are going to flow. Well, um, this has been known for a long time. It goes back to a magnificent paper of Kirchhoff in 1847, uh, where he showed that currents flow in the network according to um, laws which he formulated. I'm not going to go into the details of Kirchhoff's laws, but give a sort of mathematical simplification, simplification here. We assign vertices a function which is called an electrical potential. And the link between potentials and currents in each edge is given by Ohm's law, which is that the potential difference is equal to the current times the resistance. If F is the potential, we're going to choose our battery so that the potential difference between A and B is one. And if I, X, Y is the current, so we're going to give it to the electrons flowing from X to Y, then the potential difference F, Y minus F, X is the resistance, in other words, W, X, Y to the minus one times the current, and that holds for each X, Y. Now, current is conserved at all points except the um, vertices A and B. And so summing this quantity and rearranging, we get that we find that the function f is harmonic in the, the, the graph v except at the points a and b. So we can find the potential as a solution to the Dirichlet problem, um, boundary conditions f b and at f a, and harmonic function um, everywhere else. And for a finite network, it's easy to prove uniqueness for this Dirichlet problem. Um, in general, it's not true for an infinite network. So that's basic electrical um, circuit theory. Now, what's the connection with random walk? So let's write Tx for the um, time it takes random walk to hit a point x, phi x for the probability starting in x that random walk hits b before it hits a. We find with a little bit of um, work that the function phi solves the same Dirichlet problem as f. So if we are on a finite network, the function phi is actually equal to the function f. And so these hitting probabilities here um, are also the um, electrical potentials um, connected with random, with um, elect the electric network. We need to go a little further to find a useful connection between random walk and electrical resistance. The total flow through the network is given by the amount of current flowing out of the um, node um, A. It's also the amount flowing into the vertex node B. And the first, the, the key thing which gives us something more than uh, the probability gives us is the concept of electrical resistance. And here's the first definition that we're going to make, which is we define it as one over the flow between A and B when we have a unit potential difference like this. And I want to make one more calculation. So let's, the effective resistance or inverse of it is the flow. That's the amount of current, total amount of current flowing out of A. Use Ohm's law to substitute here. F of A is zero. So we get this expression here. And using the Markov property, we find that the effective resistance is the weight of A times the probability starting in A that the, the random walk hits B before it's first returned to A. So we have an expression for this probability in terms of effective resistance. Now let's look at an infinite weighted graph. I'm going to take all the vertices outside a ball BAR and combine them into one vertex BR. So we're now looking at a finite graph. 
then WA times the probability starting in A that X hits, leaves this ball before its first return to A is just one over the effective resistance between A and B R. I'm going to define the effective resistance from X to infinity as this limit here. Um, easy to show, show that limit exists as a monotonicity of these resistances. Recalling the definition of tau A R, we can rewrite this expression like this. W A, the probability that the random walk exits the ball before its first return to A is one over the effective resistance. Letting R tend to infinity, we get the following theorem due to Don and Stirling 1984, which is that X is recurrent if and only if this probability is zero. And that's if and only if the effective resistance from A to infinity is infinite. So this gives a characterization of recurrence and therefore also of transience in terms of the effective resistance between a point in the graph and infinity. And intuitively, this connection solves Feller's problem. Um, if like me, you've done lots of calculations with um, uh, network simplification at high school, um, you, you've got you know, you, you, you kind of know intuitively that removing edges is going to be increasing the effective resistance. And so it's going to make the process more recurrent. So um, that gives an intuitive explanation of why Feller's um, problem should be true. But um, we shouldn't really, as mathematicians, just be relying on our sort of physical intuition. There are, in fact, there are situations where our intuition may lead us to expect monotonicity, but in fact, it does not hold. Here's one very striking result from um, road traffic, Bray's paradox. It, I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but you look at journey times in a road network with congestion, more traffic on the road slows down journey times for everybody. And the surprising fact is that adding a road can actually increase the average journey times in, in the network. Um, not at all what one would um, expect. So even where our intuition leads us to expect monotonicity, um, we, we may not get it. Let me add as another example, um, if you look at the an infinite, well, a, a graph and you look at P2n xx, in other words, the probability that random walk returns to x after 2n steps, you might think that adding edges is going to make that quantity smaller. That's not always true. But here are two variational characterizations of effective resistance um, called by Dolan Snell, Rayleigh and Thompson's principles. The first gives the inverse of the effective resistance as the infimum of the energy of a functions which are zero at A and one at B. And the second variational principle is you look at unit flows where you're <clears throat> basically transporting current from um, uh, A to B and you need to transport a unit amount of current from A to B. Then one finds that the effective resistance is the minimum, minimum energy of such a transported current for a finite graph. <coughs> So we have two variational principles. One is going to, so you, you, you shove in an arbitrary function f, which satisfies these conditions. That gives you an upper bound on rf to the minus one, so a lower bound on rf. You shove in a feasible flow, in other words, a flow which satisfies these conditions here, and you get an upper bound on ref. So these variational principles allow you to bound effective resistance above and below, <coughs> um, even, in cases when you may not be able to calculate it precisely. Um, it's easy to deduce from these variational principles that removing edges increases effective resistance. And um, a remark of Dave Aldous, I think, um, in a way it's these variational principles which bring something new to the random walk theory. <laughs> it's very hard to get this kind of um, uh, monotonicity result directly by um, random walk. Um, uh, methods, which don't sort of, in some sense, go off into the analysis or effectively reproduce the um, calculations that we're doing here with effective resistance. A final couple of definitions. 
it's useful to define the effective resistance between two sets in, in an analogous way to that given by um, Rayleigh's principle. In other words, it's the minimum energy of a function, which is zero on A and one on B. And we also have um, stability in that if we look at weights W prime, which are comparable with W, then the energy form EW prime is comparable to the energy form EW. And it follows that resistances in the W prime graph are comparable to resistances in the W graph. And since transients and recurrence can be characterized in terms of these resistances here, we deduce that transients and recurrence is stable under comparable weights. So before I end this lecture, let me just mention one or two other points, uses of resistance bounds. Um, this is the result not in Doyle and Snell. On a finite weighted graph, one finds that the round trip time between A and B, in other words, you start at A and you look how long it takes to get to B, then you start at B and you look how long it takes to get back to A again, is given by the resistance times the um, weight of the whole graph. And um, I'm not actually sure who first produced this theorem. I'm calling it school of Doyle and Snell in allergy, analogy to what happens in um, art where you have school of Michelangelo or whatever. So let A and B be disjoint um, and a point X, which isn't in either of them. Then you can estimate the probability that you go from A, you hit A before you hit B um, in terms of resistances um, like this. So sometimes this is a useful bound, um, sometimes of course not. And I want to conclude this lecture by one, two more remarks on stability. Um, most or possibly all proofs that a random walk property P is stable involve giving a characterization of P in terms of the on-diagonal Dirichlet form EFF or the restriction of the Dirichlet form to sets um, as defined by looking at just at points X, Y, and A and summing over the energy of the function F in that set. And can I, in 1985, introduce the concept of rough isometry between metric spaces? And the idea here is that two metric spaces are roughly isometric if they have the same large scale structure. For example, if you've got a finite graph, then Z2 and the product of Z2 and the finite graph are both roughly isometric in the sense that they have, locally they may be very different, but at large ranges, they both look like Z2. And in all the cases known to me, if you've got a characterization of a random work property in terms of the on-diagonal Dirichlet forms EAFF, one can also prove that it's stable under rough isometries. So although stability under rough isometries is quite a bit more general than weight stability, in the end, they turn out, it seems to be, um, uh, when one holds, then the other holds. Okay, that's the end of my um, first talk. So thank you very much, Martin, for the clear and beautiful lecture. So here is uh, one question uh, via chat. Uh, uh, the question is, can we think uh, that a, a Sherpinsky gasket is a weak limit of percolation graphs uh, analogous to the Donskard theorem for random walks? Hmm. Um, I'm... Well, there are, initially I would say probably not, but of course one can be very ingenious and so it may be possible to do this. Mm -hmm. If we go back to what the Sierpinski gasket looks like, uh, he, he, uh, I guess we'll go back just a bit more. Um, if you look at percolation on a sort of graphical Sierpinski gasket, mm -hmm. then it's rather easy to see that in fact, PC is equal to one for this graph. If you've got even a tiny chance of um, removing an edge, then there's a positive probability that all these four edges are going to be removed and all these four edges are going to be removed. And so zero is going to be disconnected from um, the rest of the graph. So there is, unfortunately for the graphical Sierpinski gasket, there is no um, uh, phase transition um, uh, there's no non-trivial phase transition, um, PC is equal to, to one. So um, of course you actually have written a paper on percolation on these um, fractals. Um, so maybe you could see if you can 
think of a way of getting it um, in the way that the question suggests, but um, <laughs> I have to say that I can't, okay. at least not, well, not initially. Well, I don't have answer to you. <laughs> <laughs> so any other questions? If you have questions, please uh, type on chat. It's okay. So I have one uh, kind of <laughs> historical question. So I understand that uh, your first work on uh, 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 Brownian motion of fractals is a, a 1988 paper with uh, Ed Parkins. And yes. how did you get how how did you get uh, interested in fractals? How so, did you, um, yeah. so one day when I was in the statistical laboratory, um, mm -hmm. uh, a mathematician from the applied department came in and showed me some pictures of Sierpinski gaskets um, uh, and said, uh, you know, can you, um, uh, what, can you say anything about harmonic functions on these, um, uh, on, on these sets? So mm -hmm. that would have been in the summer of, um, ooh, I think it was the summer of 1985. So this is mm -hmm. a time, you know, these things were very much in the air. Um, mm -hmm. And I sort of, thought about the question for a few minutes or for a little bit and didn't get anywhere, but I sort of stored it up in my list of questions. And then when I went to um, UBC on sabbatical in January, 1986, um, Ed and I looked at a number of problems to look at and decided to tackle this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So any more questions? Please type on the chat. Okay. Okay. If not, uh, let's thank Martin. Thank you. So uh, Martin's second lecture will be uh, on Wednesday at the same time. Okay. So thank you very much. I guess we have five minutes break. Okay. Thank you. I'm not quite sure how to stop sharing. Uh, well, at least you can. There we are. Yeah, okay. <laughs>